I think the key skill of architecture is about communication. Hello and welcome to the Business of Architecture. I am your host, Ryan Willard, and in today's segment, I'm very pleased to be engaging in a wonderful conversation with Chris Simmons, a multi-talented individual who skillfully intertwines the roles of an architect, illustrator, and educator rooted in the heart of London and the southeast of the UK. Chris holds the esteemed position of Associate Director at the distinguished Brixen based architecture practice Squire and Partners, an establishment renowned for its creative flair and architectural ingenuity. You might remember the brilliant uh, conversation I had with Henry Squire a few years ago on the podcast where I visited their beautiful department store refurbishment, renovation job, redevelopment, master plan um, down in Brixton, which I thought was absolutely brilliant and one of the most fantastic offices I've been in for a while. Furthermore, Chris is the visionary behind Architects Instruction, which is an innovative mentoring platform, which has been meticulously crafted to bolster the professional journey of architects and designers. Through his personalized guidance, Chris endeavors to pave pathways for professionals to ascend into realms of happier, healthier, healthier and unequivocally rewarding careers enriched with creativity and innovation. Chris is a passionate advocate for the dissemination of architectural knowledge. He is a familiar face in the digital sphere, consistently illuminating online platforms with insightful narratives on all facets of architecture. His eloquent contributions have fostered a community of enthusiastic followers on LinkedIn and Instagram, connecting like-minded individuals with a shared reverence for architectural artistry. So in this episode, we discuss about the career pathways into architecture, some of the challenges that the industry faces, um, tips, ideas, and strategies for younger architects to be able to develop their um, their ability to be able to win new jobs, um, how they can be developing professionally, the kind of career planning aspects that are that are essential. And we look about at the, the kind of importance of business education that's often missing and lacking in our typical architectural education and how not having that has serious consequences. So sit back, relax and enjoy Chris Simmons. It's time to announce this month's 200 Club. If you missed our episode on the 200 Club, listen to BOA episode 485 to learn more about this new initiative to benchmarking small firm performance. So a big congratulations to Drew and Justine Tindall, Irini Adams, Ramiro Torres, Chris Brandon, Mark Elster, Sven Levine, Thomas Norton, Charles Scram, Ian and Tony Wilson, Ryan Salaz, Yost Bende, Lena Bola, Judy and Larry Apple, Paul Charnet and Kyle Glandon, and Gilbert Atik. Great job to everybody who's made it into our 200 Club members this month. Keep it up. This episode is sponsored by Smart Practice, Business of Architecture's flagship program to help you structure your firm for freedom, fulfillment, and financial profit. If you want access for our free training on how to do this, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you want to speak directly to one of our advisors about how he might be able to help you, please follow the link in the information. Chris, welcome to the Business of Architecture. How are you? Uh, yeah, good. Thank you for having me. I've been uh, a long time listener of the podcast, so I'm uh, kind of flabbergasted to actually be on the, on on the podcast. So yeah, well, lovely to be here. My my absolute um, privilege and pleasure to have you on. I've been very inspired with your social media presence, your leadership that you've taken on in the industry. You're an architect. You're you're a director at um, Squire and Partners. You've been there for what nearly ten years. Yeah, so I'm an associate director at Squire. Has been there for nine and a half, coming up ten years. Um, yeah, fantastic. So, so uh, a long, a long career in a in a one of the UK's top architecture practices, and a few. How long ago was it? Maybe a, a year, or two, couple of years ago when you started the architect instruction. Yeah, I think it's been. Ooh. It's been two years now, I think. Yeah. Um, yeah, so that's been steadily, steadily growing. And, you know, as as with a lot of people, it started as a, a lockdown hobby and um, yeah. has, has sort of steadily grown. Um, 
yeah, yeah. and and you know as, as with all nice things open lots of interesting opportunities and and things like this really it's, it's been a very kind of compelling uh feed or kind of curation of beautiful pictorial illustrations and drawings and then kind of heartwarming anecdotes and stories and advice really about how to progress your career and evolve and a, perhaps a lot of advice that gets missing in in architecture either from at university or even in your in your own career development i, I, I sometimes feel that that, that your, your kind of career advice if you like or mentorship is not always present what was it that had you start the architect's instruction so I think I started, as I said, it was it was a, a lockdown thing, and I, I started um, really kind of remembering how important drawing was to me. So, you know, I kind of I've always drawn. I've always, you know, it's always been an important part of who I am and and what I do in architecture and stuff. And I started drawing as a kind of cathartic thing of you know being at home with the kids all day and and trying to work from home using the evenings to kind of just draw something. And um, I don't know how I started, but I, you know, I, I did one post of a drawing that I'd done online, got a very sort of positive response and it ended up, you know, lots of nice comments and things. And, and I was like, oh, there's, you know, maybe there's something quite nice in this. Um, so I started kind of regularly doing that, posting online, you know, doing my drawings and things. And then I suppose you kind of open, you know, the, you're more, the more you're kind of involved with the platform, you you kind of open yourself up to different things. And I started seeing other people posting things about architecture and, and I think things specifically about architecture students. So um, there's one page, which is to scale, which is by yeah. um, Sana. Um, so she was growing a page, which she was, I think she was a part one at the time. And she was talking about her experience um, as a part one. And, and, you know, her going back to uni and all those sorts of things. And, you know, it really kind of struck me as something that was, you know, if, if, if someone was kind of talking about that when I was a student, that would be incredibly useful. Mm -hmm. So it kind of inspired me to kind of think, okay, I'm a bit longer in the tooth and a bit more experienced. Maybe there's, you know, people that will value my kind of experience and my kind of um, help um and, and and started kind of you know hosting things that were, were trying to help people either you know sort of transitioning from university to practice or people at you know a sort of architect level looking to you know grow or um you know go up the food chain sort of thing mm -hmm. um you know there's that thing about you know helping people a, a few years behind me so that's that's kind of you know how it started and and i suppose how it's grown what what are for you? Do you think a lot of the, the the struggles, challenges that young architects are facing, and you know, and and architects in employment face a lot of? Well, I suppose there's that age old disconnect that everyone's kind of aware of, and and we all kind of know about, you know, the, the disconnect between university and practice. And you know, I like many people came out of university. I mean, I I loved university. I I, you know, really engaged. I went to Canterbury, which is a very sort of creative arts based university, like fully, you know, into that sort of mindset. Really enjoyed it, really thought it of, of, of a lot of use and opened my eyes up to a lot of things. But, you know, there is a clear when going into practice, uh, my clear experience was, you know, Jesus, this is quite different than all of those skills I've kind of learned. There are, you know, sort of the, the design skills, but the actual day to day thing of being an architect is quite different. So, I think a lot of it is based on, you know, that sort of that sort of theme of of kind of filling in the gaps that you don't necessarily get taught. But there are, you know, similar threads at every level, you know, when when people are moving from architects to, you know, associate or, you know, middle management levels. Again, you're you're moving a threshold, but without much kind of new knowledge or training or anything like that, you kind of learn on the job. So mm -hmm. again, that's that's people kind of you know, needing to understand a whole series of management type skills that we're not really taught that we're, you know, kind of expected to kind of get to grips with and things like that. So there are those sort of thresholds in, in architecture and, and you know, and, and lots of other careers. But having that kind of helping hand, I think, is is kind of super important. And it's it's kind of the chord that kind of struck me.
when you know kind of planning this stuff that that's that's quite interesting you know the, the kind of professional career developments you know university is in a way quite quite structured and certainly becoming licensed as an architect is a very structured kind of formal process so structured in fact that it's kind of quite difficult to get off once you're once you're on it sure yeah. uh, um, but then when we enter into kind of becoming becoming an architect there are all these new skill sets to to learn you're dealing with people you're now kind of responsible for other people's results when you start leading or managing teams there's kind of communication with the, with the client and if you're fortunate enough to be a of the aptitude to kind of learn through immersion then then great but then you also need to be immersed in the right kind of environment with the right sorts of people who are doing the right sorts of things in the first place mm. um yeah. And, and often that's not the case and it's kind of, you know, bad habits being passed on. And there isn't any kind of space for reflection. I think that's the other, the, the, you know, I'm, I'm fascinated by some of the traditional methods that, of Japanese boat making, for example, where the students go in and they're not allowed to ask any questions or do anything for like a year. And it's kind of like a silent meditative practice where they're just watching. They have to learn instinctively, you know, to respond to what mm -hmm. the, what the master's responses are now that's in a kind of very beautiful controlled sort of yeah, yeah. In, in environment but in, and it's also in the context of like people being very reflective over what they're looking mm -hmm. at and what they're seeing and i think that space of reflection is often missing in our own careers which is why something like what you're doing is so powerful because it does offer people to just take a little step back a bit from from your perspective what the the in your, and perhaps in your own career um, what were the, the kind of difficult movement points, if you like? Well, I suppose I, I always, like you say, the, the reflection thing is something I do quite a lot in my own, you know, self neuroses type thing. But I think I've always been kind of quite, um, quite privileged in that I've had a lot of good people around me. Like all of the people I've worked for have been very good, caring, interested mentors sort of thing. And that's, I think that's kind of a key thing that's, you know, my career has been built on these people that had the time, the patience, the interest to kind of go above and beyond to kind of help me with things. And I think, I think a lot of people don't unfortunately get that because, you know, not everyone are as selfless or, or, or uh, you know, willing to give their time in that extra way sort of thing. You know, it's not just by being in practice because there are lots of things where you require, you know, questions, answers, time, you know, time out of your your day-to-day -day working to kind of take that point. So I, I think for me, it's kind of, you know, I, I can kind of think about those kind of leaps of my part one, part two, part three sort of thing. And the sort of key people around that. So, for example, so as I said, I went I went to Canterbury um, for my part one and, and my part two actually. Started in a um, medium sized practice, um, designing sort of churches and and sort of public buildings in Kent. And again, you know, there was there was a single guy there. The the I think he was an associate, and he was that person that really took time and effort to educate me to you know, not just in the sort of day job, but, you know, all the other sort of bits around it. I, I eventually um, got made redundant from there and then started at Hawks Architecture. So Hawks is a uh, run by Richard Hawks, which is um, they do sort of one-off private houses in the countryside. So he'd um, just finished his house, um, which had been on Grand Designs um when i started and there was i think there was one or two other people in the office but it was literally you know from the ground up small practice in his you know we were working out of his passive house sort of thing and, and trying to understand all the tech around it and you know this thing so i mean that was a super interesting experience because again richard's a really interesting and kind person that's you know taking the effort to teach you a lot of things but you are kind of in this new build passive house learning all these kind of new technologies and things as you go which was kind of super engaging and and um you know a completely different experience than i had before so i think i think that was that kind of you know throwing yourself into um from the sort of part one university era to practice and you know i had two very helpful mentors in that and i continue to work with hawks part time during my um part two part two was you know again 
I had um, Charles Holland, who was previously at FAT as a tutor, and he was, you know, again, a super engaging, really interesting person and, and supportive and all that sort of thing, like super experiences with them. And then eventually ended up at Squire and Partners, you know, moving from a very small practice in Kent to, you know, the big city, you know, and, and onto much larger things and, you know, doing very different, you know, huge scale residential things and master plans and offices and stuff. And yeah, I think it's, I think again, it's just the, 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 the helpfulness of people around you, the, the, mm-hmm. the mentors that take their time and, and, you know, each, each leap, I've been very kind of lucky to have them, I think. Somewhere like um, Squires, I imagine have a, a, a quite a structured process for mentoring or for or for at least nurturing and kind of incubating talent. It's not it's not uncommon that there's. I, I often speak to Squire employees who have been there for a long for a long period of time, so they're they're clearly doing something well. Yeah, it's it's an interesting one, Squires, because it's you know it's a, it's a family practice. You know, Michael Squire unfortunately yeah. recently passed away, and and you I, I remember you interviewed Henry before, um, yeah. who was his son. Um, you know, it's it's very much that kind of feel of family and nurturing and stuff. And I think it is very much about the people. I think that's one of the really positive things that the people are all really great, and you know they're all decent human beings, sort of thing, doing the right stuff. So I think so much of it comes from the people and 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 as you say the the systems are kind of in place i mean luckily i'm now involved or have been involved for the last six years in the education group so you know we have very structured um part three mentoring systems and you know helping people graduate from you know being architectural assistants to architects sort of thing so you know a lot of time and effort goes into nurturing people and you know we've recently um started up an apprenticeship scheme with oxford brooks so um that's taking part one students becoming architects so you know it's something we're all very keen to be involved in and and you know me particularly trying to drive it drive it through the practice and and you know i, I think it's kind of key when you when you have a larger practice like that you know having those mm-hmm. systems in place because you know it's you can get swallowed by the work a lot of the time, but having that impetus to have that kind of point of, like you say, reflection and, and you know, actually understanding your growth and your position within the practice and where you can go sort of thing is, is kind of super important. This this relationship between university education and, and practice and, you know, you spoke earlier about the, the kind of the disconnect that often happens and, you know, the, you know, I've heard different architects refer to it as different things like the fall off the pit, the whatever, you know, this kind of idea that you're in this one world in academia and then suddenly you fall into the real world of practice and you're like, what? This is so, you know, this is so unrecognizable from what was happening at, at university. And then we'll often, you know, if I talk to educators, then they'll be, um, you know, very, and rightfully so in, in, in some aspects. You know, we're not preparing students to become solely architects. And from the practice perspective, I'll speak to practice leaders and, and go, well, you are. That is that, like they're paying money to become architects. Like what yeah. do they think that they're, what do they think that they're investing? Is that clear to them, that, to, to a student, what they're, what they're paying for? And also it has an impact as well, the, the disconnect in terms of salaries and, and, and fees, because for a part one, you know, we were just looking recently online, I can't remember who was posting this morning, um, might have been the LSA, but kind of showing the, the pay of, uh, mm. of, a, of a part one graduate in, in London. And, you know, that's a very difficult salary to be, to be living off. And you know, part of the equation here is, well, you now have got businesses that need to, that I need to invest a lot to train, say, a part one. Um, and then you've got businesses who, higher part ones thinking, you know, this is on the business's fault because they actually need a more experienced senior architect and they're trying to be cheap and then they hire a part one and they part one can't do 90% of the things that they that they want. So there's clearly a, a, a sort of, you know, a disconnect here. How, mm. how do you see it being strengthened or being improved? And what are some of the kind of more structural issues at play? 
Yeah, I, I mean, yeah, everything you said is completely correct. And, and you know, I can, I can completely see it from both sides, because as I said, I had an incredible time at university and I was one of those people that really, you know, engaged with it and that way of thinking and the theory and all, all of these things. And I completely see the validity of, you know, opening your eyes up to the concept of design and how you design things and, and not not just producing people that do things in one way and you know uh, you know I, I completely appreciate and 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 um agree with that but at the same time like you say you know part ones coming out require a lot of effort from the practices and and, and like you say the, their salaries ref- reflect that which is which is incredibly difficult because you know <laughs> everyone thinks that architects have a lot of money and and you know they can do but also you're coming into a field which people will struggle in i think ultimately the the the, the way i kind of see the, the thing progressing i mean particularly the lsa and, and apprenticeship so we we've had students for the last i think five years at the lsa which i think is an incredibly impressive and forward thinking school and and uh, you know particularly now with neil shusher at the, at the front of it sort of thing um the 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 idea of of combining you know practice and university literally to try and solve some of those problems is is for me a progressive thing and you know looking at the apprenticeship model uh, again you know uh, we've 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 had lots of conversations with the london universities and with oxford and cambridge about their apprenticeship schemes and and you know we we've, we've moved forward with oxford brooks for for our apprenticeship and that is you know for the for the level of seven apprenticeship it's four years to become an architect from from being a part one so obviously it's a a longer period but the 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 fees are covered by our apprenticeship levy which the practice pays into anyway um mm-hmm. and the student is paid full-time salary working four days a week in practice and one day um remotely at university with um i think three monthly kind of intensives so you know, I can think back to when I did my um, my tar- part two experience, the amount I was learning on the ground sort of thing, just like you say, you know, communicating with clients, communicating with design team members and, you know, just the whole different series of skill sets sort of thing. So being able to grow that on one side while still kind of holding on to that kind of design theoretical kind of important kind of big question sort of thing feels to me, you know, a very positive thing. And I think I think those are you know really kind of key good um, examples of that, but I do struggle with it because I don't necessarily think that's always going to be the answer. You know, I, mm. I, I think I think there's definitely a place for apprenticeships and definitely a place for um, you know model models like the LSA. But you know, I can think back when I did my part two. You know, fully throwing yourself into university is kind of does make you think differently it does bring out something that you know you don't necessarily get if you were just coming in practice you know i think the last thing we kind of want is to produce a a whole group of architects which can't think you know outside of of you know legislation or outside of the box if you will so Mm -hmm. it's it's i think it's something that no one's ever you know quite got the the answers to yet well it's 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 it's, hmm. it's very interesting because i mean there's there is you know, I'll, I'll often be very critical of, of the university and the kind of um, education system, but I don't want that to undermine, like, again, I had a very similar experience to you. I, I was at the Bartlett and very kind of out there thinking school, mm. and it did change the way that I thought, and it actually allowed me in many ways to break out of doing, you know, having a, a traditional architectural career, if you like, because I was kind of encouraged sure. to, to, to think differently. Um, and there's a, and we're also starting to see, you know, a lot of value in architectural thinking and strategic thought and way of viewing the world that gets picked up in other industries and you can get remunerated incredibly healthily. You know, we we were just chatting to somebody just before this conversation about, um, the stuff that Google's doing in terms of their master planning and, you know, live cities and, and, you know, kind of software and data driven urban master planning and you know go go and work there and how how to integrate search engines and ai into the actual fabric of the city i mean it's, you know that's that's the kind of domain that we end up talking about at university mm, um, and then someone like google they're not hiring you know 
just architects they're hiring all sorts of different disciplines and so the, the architectural uh, kind of framework of education can be very valuable in these other new new fields the architecture industry itself is a little bit different um and and i, and I wonder how like let's say apprenticeships become much more of a, a, a popular thing how, how would you anticipate a business would be able to um educate an individual in design and uh, how, how could a business kind of facilitate that out of the box type of thinking or create that same safe environment that university creates yeah i think i think that's a real that's a real potential issue with all of this because it's I think university gives you time and space to kind of think like that, you know, that with, with, with business and, and practice, you know, everything is, it needs to be done yesterday and, and, you know, the, the workloads and stuff don't a lot of the time allow for, you know, even, even, you know, things we need to be doing on the side or business um, management or working in the business sort of thing, you know, it's a, it's a real struggle even to do that. So, you know, I, I guess it's with with structure and with putting this this time aside to do certain things. You know, for, for example, you know we have to, as as part of my mentoring thing with the level seven apprentice, you know we have to give time to you know structure time to to sit down and and, and go through, um, you know, not only the students' experience from a practice point of view, from a, a university point of view, and the sort of pastoral care type thing you know it's i think unless you make time for these things they're not going to happen i, th I think it, yeah. it does sort of you know raise it raise an interesting question of using the student as a sort of r d type thing so that's something we've had in our sort of conversations with oxford brooks is that they want the student to be um their sort of project work to be have a feedback loop back into practice sort of thing so the things that the practice is kind of exploring are sort of mutually beneficial for the student and the practice sort of thing. So I think you can imagine kind of a, a position where, you know, for example, you know, I've had these conversations with our student about our, our building in Brixton. So, you know, the department store is an existing historic building that's been kind of carefully, you know, reused in different ways and, and things taken away, things brought in, you know, uh, taking something that's, you know, was sort of forgotten about in the city and bringing life back into it involving the community. So, you know, we were having conversations with, you know, whether her project could be, you know, of a similar vein and using that as a kind of research project to kind of, you know, plug back in into our practice. So I think you would have to imagine a future, if apprenticeships do become more prevalent, of, of you know, things that do have an equal weighting sort of thing. Mm -hmm. But I, I completely agree with you in terms of the big picture thing, because, you know, that is the kind of the joy of university is making you think in that big picture way. And particularly, you know, I think one of the our, our big problems in, in architecture is that sort of fee question and, you know, the bringing down of fees and, and race to the bottom and all these sorts of bits and pieces is is without us thinking differently. You know, I think I think us thinking in a kind of fixed way is kind of one of the problems that's kind of brought us to this position. So, mm. you know, having that big picture thinking is kind of what we need right now. Absolutely. So, um, so it's interesting that we kind of start to pick up on the, the question of fees. And this is something, again, lots of young architects kind of, I, I, I imagine that university perhaps were a little bit incubated from architect, the realities of an architectural salary and your living life as a student, which is normally pretty um streamlined if you like economically uh so any kind of pay afterwards you know seems like a luxury and then you realize oh right it's not it's not a lot of pay um and the kind of and sometimes the growth trajectory can look quite not that exciting if you like how mm. how do how do you educate or kind of open up the conversation with practicing architects about the business side of the practice and like how money is working in the business and how and how and how the kind of fees relate back to salaries yeah sure i think i think so much of it comes from transparency you know mm -hmm. the 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 whole issue you know like we say we, we 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 go to university and then we go to get a job and we're so focused on getting a job we then realize oh you know what we're going to get paid sort of thing so it, like you say it is kind of a, a kind of surprise and and having that sort of disconnect so 
you know, at, at one end, you know, just just sort of clearly, you know, job adverts telling you what the salaries are, which which pe- which is incredibly painful, and, and people seem to be gradually coming round to the idea of recently, but still not everyone. To you know, uh, again, educating people within practice to understand what the impact of their time is on on salaries, on on productivity, on profitability. You know, I think I think so much of it is within our sort of management structures. That element is behind closed doors, whether it's intentional or not. You know, because people are so focused in in doing the project work, and and I think a lot of the time people keep that sort of level of information away from the general staff because they don't they they want either want them to focus on what they're doing or they don't think they're kind of interested or or kind of you know they they they're, they're not part of that conversation. And I think for mm-hmm. me. You know, giving people agency and people education, whatever their age, you know, in practice from part one to, you know, senior level, having that sort of conversation of what does this line on this page mean? What does, you know, my time mean in relation to, you know, the fee, which in turn will in the end of the day, you know, relate to profitability and and, and my salary sort of thing. So I think, you know, education and and transparency can only be a good thing in all of those but again it takes time effort and willing from you know practice owners and leaders and management level people to communicate it you know mm-hmm. we we all fill out of our fill out our time sheets but you know for a lot of people it's kind of oh, it's a pain in the ass and and you know I'll just make it up and you know we have conversations internally about how important that is because it then makes people you know management level people understand how long a job takes and how profitable and how productivity and all these things relate to things and and you know having that again that sort of disconnect between management level and staff level and and communication i think again is that kind of key thing so how do you how do you broach a conversation with either um, people that you're engaging with on social media or even team members when they ask you know i want to get paid more how do i how do we do this how do i how do i earn more as an architect what kind of mm. how, how how do you guide somebody with that question or or how is it structured or well, is it I think it's, it's... <laughs> <laughs> yeah sometimes um no so so i think a lot of it is we always talk about you know online and everything about architects communicating their value you know mm-hmm. and you know that's that's seen as a super important thing to from architects to clients, you know, everyone talks about that, you know, every, everyone's got a misconception about what architects do, what value we provide, things like that. I like to think about it as, you know, take that and put it internal, you know, internalize it. What is the value I'm doing? What is the value I'm providing? How am I seen as an employee or, you know, whatever position I am within the within the chain? How do I add value to this process, whether it's through skills and or, or um, efficiency or things like that? So, you know, for example, <clears throat> you know, in, in my own experience sort of thing, I've always been very keen on adding my value to the practice as a whole. So, you know, I, you know, I think I'm pretty good at my job and, you know, I've made my way up the, the, the chain within the practice, but I've always been very keen in, in doing sort of extracurricular things within the practice. So running yeah. this education side, running the sustainability side of things. And it's, I think, you know, that as a, kind of methodology of, of showing your willing. So not only are you, you know, doing your job and, and, and you're doing well at it, but you're also showing that you're investing your time and effort into the practice and you care about it as something you care about other staff. You know, I think I think something like that shows so much of your value as a person, being a decent human being and and, and showing that you care about something and you're willing to commit to it. Mm-hmm. Um, but also communicates a lot about, you know, your 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 sort of value as an architect. So you know, I, th- I think some people, you know, talk about specialising in different areas or, you know, becoming incredibly efficient with different processes. You know, you get lots of people that are very into technology and things. You know, we have lots of people that are very passionate Revit users and, and promote themselves on how much they can, you know, model in an hour sort of thing. And, uh, you know, the sort of efficient efficiency questions. But I think, I mean, the other the other aspect of that is is if if younger architects want to progress in their practices i think a lot of it comes down to management and you know you will you will see people through time that are clear communicators clear people 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 you know what i mean like kind of people that can understand a team understand management level things 
um, can communicate things clearly and can really kind of, um, you know, create sort of close relationships with their colleagues and stuff. And I think, I think that sort of value really shows out as well, particularly in larger mm-hmm. practices where you have hierarchical structures where people are looking to progress. You know, I think that's kind of a key thing is, I mean, it's, it doesn't come naturally to a lot of people. Sure. But I think a lot of the time, if you're looking to progress in that way, showing those sort of leadership skills are again, you know, promoting value that's kind of above your position of, of an everyday architect sort of thing. And, and and kind of at the like associate director level, director level in the in the practice, do you actively kind of sit down and identify people who are kind of exhibiting those kinds of attributes and, and qualities? Or Yeah, completely. Like, completely and, yeah, and, yeah. And I think it is a clear thing. I think I think when you see something in somebody, you know, I, I think half of it is people that get on with things. You know, what I mean, like there's, there's there's people that are, are clearly capable and clearly capable of taking charge of something and aren't just floating along sort of thing. They're they're they're, they're people that you know are, are are able to move things forward and able to solve problems. And it's it's that thing of you know, there's, there's no kind of stupid questions in anything, you know, you want people to ask questions, but you also want people to take initiative and show leadership qualities. And, you know, when people do that, it is, it's clear. And I think, I think there is that kind of balance of, you know, I think, I think you can always see when people are very passionate so about self promoting, but don't have the things to back it up. Mm-hmm. And I think, naturally i'm a sort of quieter sort of milder person and there are people around you that are probably louder and and and, you know better at talking themselves up and stuff but i think when you're doing a good job it's very clear to your bosses you know i I think there there is a kind of a a key thing in that is, is 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 your ability but you know i i think it's important to kind of again have that kind of self reflective thing you know if i'm mm-hmm. if i'm making if i'm making an effort to progress in my career you know i i want to be leading that i want to be taking charge of that and i write i write about this on social media quite a lot is you know the idea of no one else is going to do it for you you have to kind of mm. take charge of that thing and you know create those touch points with your 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 management structure and and, and create those kind of moments that you are kind of guiding them helping you know them to you know, do what you want them to do sort of thing. As as you do with your clients, as you do with your design teams, you know, we have to kind of, you know, get people to believe in us in all of our thing. You know, if I'm a I'm an architect asking a client to believe in my design, you know, it's the same thing as I'm I'm an architect asking my manager to believe in me and to push me forward sort of thing. It's about getting people on board and 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 kind of, you know, taking them on the journey and believing in you, I suppose. I I love this. This is this is I often use the word uh, you know, there's entrepreneurial and then there's intrapreneurial, and what you're describing mm-hmm. kind of falls into this idea of being intrapreneurial, which is, you know, you, you do you need to market and sell yourself within an, an organization. You need to be able to take leadership and be proactive, and also set a kind of vision and a mission, if you like, for your own career and where you want to go, and kind of have a look at well, how can I be in the same way that you would with a business? You're kind of asking where can I provide extra value. And be remunerated for it, and kind of exactly. really, you know, really take take control of it. And and it's amazing when you do start doing that, how many resources suddenly emerge, mm-hmm. and how willing people are actually to to help. But otherwise, it becomes it becomes very difficult. It's a it's a kind of um, you, you have to you have to kind of walk into it if you like. You have to uh, take the the, the the initiative. Sure. In mm-hmm. in terms of um, say people winning jobs or or getting hired i know you've, you've done quite a few interesting posts um around around actually getting hired and in your position at, at squires i imagine that you guys are hiring quite a lot and that you're quite actively involved in seeing hundreds of cvs and you yeah. you know which yeah. ones which ones work which ones don't work what kind of advice would you give to people who are kind of entering into the workforce or who are even looking to, at changing um changing offices or practices what sorts of things do you see that don't work and what sorts of things really stand out for you yeah sure i i mean yeah you're right we 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 do see lots of cvs and we you know we're going through a proper sort of hiring thing at the moment and and i i think sometimes people have to kind of realize particularly if they're 
uh, you know, applying to larger practices is that it's a time pressured thing. And, and a lot of the time when practices are hiring, it's on a short time scale and it's on a, it's a reactionary thing. You know, I, I think, you know, when I was, when I was doing my part one, the practice I joined, it was, you know, the part one left, they had a new part one, the part one left, they had a new part one sort of thing. You know, it was, it was kind of that, you know, season. revolving door of, yeah, a season basically. Yeah, yeah, completely. So, you know, we would have our, our token part one for the, for the year and then we'd get another one sort of thing. And, you know, particularly in the, in, in my experience of, you know, large, you know, London based practices, the, the hiring process a lot of the time happens because the jobs come in, you know, we need to um, assemble a team, you know, we don't have the resource in house, we need to find that team, you know, I, I speak a lot about, you know, the important skills that people need, you know, to, to exhibit and, and, you know, within architecture, you know, and, and I think a lot of the time when it, I mean, well, okay, let, let, let's take this in two stages, you know, there's the initial thing of finding people. So, you know, we get CVs, portfolios through the door, you know, they all go into one big folder. And then, you know, when we need somebody, we look in that folder with, you know, this date on, and we read them. So there's a very quick process of saying, you know, understanding a CV, reviewing it from sort of first instinct sort of thing. So for me, formatting and clarity are you know so important in in um you know kind of that first impression sort of thing so you know you think about that level of information you are being judged on you know one piece of paper that says this is my name and this is what i've done and another few pages which has got some examples of your work you know it's an incredibly reduced you know level of information for you to be you as this complex interesting person to be judged on so it's so important to get that kind of i guess i, I guess get get your message across and 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 so much comes in in terms of um the sort of clarity of what you've put out there you know i have a real thing about sort of formatting and white space and and clarity of information sort of thing and and that's how you can be judged on that sort of instant level because again, yeah. you know, you're looking at hundreds of CVs, you're looking at hundreds of people sort of thing. So there's that sort of instantaneous thing. So that's, that's kind of one level, but then, you know, in interviews, obviously it's a joy to kind of talk to people do, and, and to understand, you know, their projects and, and particularly when you're hiring part ones or part twos, you know, so much of our conversation is about their university projects because, you know, we're, we're all frustrated architects with our day-to-day -day issues of, you know, the client's not paying or, or, you know, this thing not fitting in their riser sort of thing. And and they're talking about, <laughs> you know, like you say, like these, these big picture things. So there's so much joy in, you know, I get lost in, in interviews because, you know, we're, we're, we're kind of looking into their imaginary worlds and, and incredibly interesting things. And I mean, yeah, there's a, there's a kind of base level of, you know, have they used any of the software before and have they done this and have done that. But I mean, for me, it's so much about personality, so much about, you know, understanding them as a person, understanding that they're, you can get on with them. You know, my, my, my old boss mentor used to be like, you know, most of the time interviews, just checking that they're all right as a person sort of, you know what I mean? Like kind of, you can, they can have, be in your team because that's what, I mean, ultimately, you know, when you're hiring, you're hiring for someone for your team that, you know, you're going to work on whatever project it is, um, you know, for a number of years and, you know, you're going to go through highs and lows and, and, you know, through intense periods and quiet periods. And, you know, I, I think showing those sort of key personal skills of empathy and, and understanding and, and communication, you know, I always bang on about communication in architecture and, mm -hmm. and, and whether that's verbal communication, visual communication, you know, I'm, I'm super passionate about hand drawing and, and the, the simplicity of communication in that way of just being able to, you know, take whatever's in your head and put it on the page sort of thing to, to clearly communicate something. So, you know, I, I, so much of what we look for and what I personally look for. And, and I think the key skill of architecture is about communication. So, yeah, I, I think there's that kind of the instant thing of, you know, the, the boring stuff of graphics and, and how things are put together and, you know, refinement of things. And then there's that kind of, kind of personality side to it. In terms of, Kind of knowing when a practice is ready to hire because as you as you say it is for most practices it is a very reactive thing and if i if i think back on all the jobs i've ever had in architecture it's very 
can't eat. I mean, I've had interviews from sending off CVs, but generally it's always been through someone I know I've known mm. or that, that kind of, that kind of network, if you like, and being able to, you hear something and then you kind of jump at it. How important do you think that is for, for most people to actually have a network in, you know, in the profession, in the industry to help them find work? And how do you go about, how do you go about building a network? Yeah. yeah I think that's, I think that's hugely important. And, you know, it, it just takes the edge off. It gets you past the sort of gatekeeping thing of, you know, when you, when you think about most times when you, when you apply for a job, it's either for an advert, so it's a, a particular, um, you know, position, or yeah. it's a speculative thing. If it's a speculative thing, you're going to info at da-da-da-da-da, and you know, you're probably ending up in the spam filter, and, you know, maybe you'll emerge from there one day. So getting past that sort of gatekeeping thing through your network is super important. I, you know, I always bang on about this online and, and, and things about students in particular building some sort of, you know, personality online and, and, and network before they become necessary sort of thing, you know, talking about yourself, talking about your work, talking about the things you're interested in. It, 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 it kind of, it creates something before, you know, you emerge out of uni, uni and go, oh crap, I need to find a job. You know, I'm, I'm very, you know, big on Instagram and, and, and LinkedIn. And, you know, I, I've lots of people, you know, message me on LinkedIn and, and say, oh, you know, something interesting. Oh, have you seen this? Da, da, da. And, and by the way, are you hiring? Sort of thing. And it just, it just, you know, because we have that connection, because we've had that conversation, you know, it, it opens the door to, you know, are there any places and, and, and you know, they get a shoe in in that way. And, and you think about, you know, having your network, having um, something like that to bolster um, your application process is is super key. So, you know, I always I always tell students to, you know, the, the minute you get to architecture school, start talking about, you know, what you're doing and, and clearly communicate the things you're interested in, you know, be known for something, you know, talk about something in particular, you know, I think they're the kind of strongest ones is when people has a, you know, people have a particular drive, you know, I, I mentored a student which had a particular interest in, in the reuse of materials from, you know, from waylaid objects to reusing them in architectural ways sort of thing. And, you know, he start you know the, the idea was that he would start posting online about that and be known for that as a thing and then you know apply to those practices which where that was particularly pertinent and interesting and you're almost kind of building your portfolio as you go sort of thing rather than again that sort of reactionary thing of of you know just going oh shit i need to you know think about a job now you know it's, it's there's so much to your network and and you know i think using myself as an example you know, just putting yourself out there opens up so many things, you know, before yeah. I started posting online, I never thought I would, you know, doing all these nice podcasts and, and, you know, talking about all these interesting things and stuff. And I mean, really, it's just by, just by chucking yourself out there and talking and, and people kind of hearing it and listening, Yeah, you know, I'm no different than anybody else. And, you know, I can, I can continue doing my day job and enjoying that, or I can kind of do something else and, and get a little bit out, else out, out of it, I suppose. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, I, I mean, I'm totally with you on that about the kind of the power of utilizing social media platforms and all of the all of the ways, the tools that we have to be able to broadcast ideas and kind of create dialogue and be visible. Like it's, mm. you know, you can you can talk about whatever it is that you want to talk about. You can create a mission, a movement. You can create communities. You can create tribes. You can create, you know, you know, a kind of a group, a new group of friends by being by allowing yourself to be be visible if you want to talk on video and speak great if you want to write great if you want to draw great you know there's there's ways of of kind of mm. becoming visible that open up opportunities that you can't even possibly have foreseen or or imagined like you know I, I, mm. this this podcast itself has opened up so many extraordinary things and it's just been you know Enoch and I sitting in our little rooms talking to people and it, it kind of just finds its way way around the world um it, it, interestingly you, you're talking there about kind of people connecting with you on say something like linkedin um and i think that's a really good strategy for uh people who when they're looking for work just to start these kinds of relationships with people who might be hiring in the future what's what's a good way of doing that versus a bad way of doing that <laughs> 
there's, there's there's definitely bad ways and i think i think when i when i first started using linkedin when i was back at uni which was what 15 years ago maybe less um as a part one it was it was the realms of you know your your window salesman or your cladding salesman sending you a message saying can i sell you this can i sell you that can i come in for a cpd you know no no warming me up no buying me dinner and and just you know, going straight in sort of thing so I, I think that's the that's the, the the worst way is is you know cold messaging no you know sort of dialogue. I think I think the best way is 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 kind of kind of think about it as you would people. You know you don't just approach you know you wouldn't just approach someone on the street, grab them and say buy this from me. You know it's about creating a human connection and it's I think it's probably that difficult thing of because it's that you know you're not you're physically disconnected from someone you know it's a it's a it's a name with a box and a line and you know if you say something who cares sort of thing but I, th I think the point is that you need to see past that and see that there's all people behind this thing and it's one of those things in business is that you know they always say you know we buy things from people people you know businesses are, are, are people at the end of the day and and creating a connection that's kind of memorable and something you nurture sort of thing is super important you know it's not just about going in for the kill it's about you know creating something creating yourself you know showing how you want to be online how you present yourself how you know people talk about your authenticity and things like that but also when you're creating connection you can be you can be sort of determined about it like i was talking about earlier you know when you're mm. you're, you're wanting to progress in a, in a in a practice you're you're still a person you're still doing your job but you're you're thinking about you know you're playing chess three steps in advance sort of thing you know similar similar process you know you're thinking about who who are the important people i need to find talk to create connections with you know within the industry within outside of the industry you know within client bodies within you know design team members sort of thing but you know warming people up through connection commenting on their stuff you know, not just posting something and expecting loads of comments, you know, you need to engage with other people. Um, I mean, and ultimately, you know, creating conversations, not being afraid to give someone a call or, you know, jump on a video call sort of thing. You know, there's lots of different ways to do it. And it's, I think it's just about creating that kind of human connection, understanding people, and also kind of being honest and open and, and you know, not being a dick. You know, there's, there's a big thing about yeah. that, of you know, just being a, promoting it you know showing yourself as 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 you know a human as well it's not just about the business it's not just about the wins and i think that's one of the kind of the things we all kind of need to learn a little bit more about and i think that's one of our kind of architectural failings is that kind of you know we only talk to you know we're, we're only trying to impress other architects we have these impenetrable websites we have this impenetrable language sort of thing we just post images of these beautiful things when they're nice and finished sort of thing you know all of all of that stuff of you know, needs to go over here and it's all about kind of you know showing behind the scenes showing you know the bits they don't want you to see teaching people about the process and you know all, all, all of the kind of interesting weird unknown you know human side of things which is is hopefully the way things are trying to move and you know the, the stuff that i find the most engaging mm -hmm. you know, and, and and you know it's about being people i suppose it's it's really interesting i think you know it, how easy it actually is to engage with somebody online and i have a lot of students and younger architects reaching out and and when somebody's very thoughtful with the way that they get in contact with me i'll jump on a call i always do mm -hmm. 15 15 minutes let's have a quick chat how can i help what, what are you doing and you know and then other times they're really poor examples of people just going straight in like you say straight in for a kill straight in for the request please hire me I want this, 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 and this, and this, and you're like, whoa, okay, that's yeah. really like imagine, yeah, imagine doing that face to face with somebody. <laughs> it's just, it's, it's really kind of comes across as very demanding, and yeah, it, it doesn't, it doesn't communicate the the right things. Whereas somebody's, you know, I'm always a sucker for someone who's listened to a, a couple of podcasts and then been thoughtful with the response, yeah. and they've they've taken time and they go, oh, I was, re I really enjoyed this conversation you had with so and so, and da da da. da. I've actually been doing this kind of stuff in my own work. You know, would you be open for chatting with me for 15 minutes? And it's like, yeah, absolutely. And I think the architecture profession is, you know, in general, um, like there's a lot of love and care 
or, or wanting to mentor the next generation mm-hmm. and to and to bring people up. I and mean, that's something I really enjoy about still being involved with the architecture profession is that there is that kind of warmth and you know for the most part a desire to want to perpetuate the the profession and to look after people who are who are entering into it and i think that younger architects shouldn't be afraid of approaching whoever they want to approach yeah sometimes you're going to get pushed back and sometimes you're probably going to make a mistake with how you do it but be persistent with it keep 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 going and like and and learn because there's there's so many you can advance in a, a career so rapidly with aligning yourself with mentors or developing these sorts of relationships yeah i think that's i think that's super important i think i think the whole mentoring thing is is incredibly in architecture because like i said so much of my career has been built on you know basically just people doing a little bit extra going the extra mile being human and and you know, having a bit of empathy and understanding, you know, this person want, is is interested, wants to progress, is asking these questions, and I just need to give them a bit of time. And that's, I mean, that's why I do it. You know, I had lots of people help me out. And that's basically why, you know, I do it. And, and hopefully people who I mentor will do it for them sort of thing. You know, we all kind of understand the process. We all understand, you know, some of the problems that we face as architects and the industry and the education thing. And I, like you say, so many people are willing to give their time and effort and, and, and stuff like that to kind of nurture, you know, is, is, is kind of a key thing. I mean, you know, there are, there are people that don't, there are practices that where it's less prevalent and there are practices where, you know, there are issues and, 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 and universities where there are issues and, you know, lots of it's been spoken about, but I think on the whole, you know, it's, it's people trying to help other people, you know, it's king. Absolutely. Well, I think that's the perfect place to conclude the the conversation. Chris, thank you so much for sharing your your insights and your spec your your expertise and just you know kind of real compassion and care uh, and contribution for for the next generation of architects and for and for the rest of the professions. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you so much for having me. And that's a wrap. And one more thing, if you haven't already, please do head on over to iTunes or Spotify and leave us a review. We'd love to read your name out here on the show and we'd love to get your feedback and we'd love to hear what it is that you'd like to see more of and what you love about the show already. This episode is sponsored by Smart Practice, Business of Architecture's flagship program to help you structure your firm for freedom, fulfillment and financial profit. And don't forget, if you want to access your free training to learn how to structure your firm or practice for freedom, fulfillment and profit, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you'd like to speak to one of our advisors directly, follow the link in the information. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract bond or commitment except to help you be unstoppable.